it's really important to find different ways to live life again, as uh, you like to say, mm-hmm. Munich, and, and get back to a productive, you know, somewhat normal, new normal, uh, how to, um, you know, get used to being living in the new you, because we can't, um, we can't put our life on hold forever uh, while we wait for the medical system to come up with a treatment for long COVID. Welcome to The Long Haulers, the official podcast of the post-COVID support community where members connect with experts and other long haulers to learn how to heal from the effects of post-COVID. Here's your host, Munish Joshi. Hi, welcome everybody. And we are going to be talking today about just living life again. And that's really what the theme is going to be. And to help us and somebody who's actually done it is our medical director, Ash Dobbin Muhammad. I'll let Ash talk about uh, where you were and where you are today in terms of uh, how post-COVID and long COVID is, is how we're going to refer to it as, has affected you. Yeah, thanks, Binish. Happy to be back here today. Um, yeah, so I've gone, I'm a long hauler. I've had COVID um, multiple times and uh, I've had a long, long haul uh, post-COVID uh, several times as well. The first time was not too bad. I could, you know, live my life with uh, some strategies and the second time I became entirely debilitated, I was unable to get up off the couch. I could not walk up a flight of stairs without being totally gassed. Um, honestly, it took, uh, I had to save hours worth of energy to get up and get myself a glass of water and make some toast for myself. Uh, so that's where I was. Um, now I'm, you know, the medical director of our team med. Uh, I am able to, um, you know, enjoy some time outside. Um, I would say probably cognitively, I've, that's where I've I gained most of my momentum. Um, physically, I'm I'm still working on that, uh, but that's okay. That's a, a work in progress. But uh, like you said, used a lot of uh, strategies and ways of coping and different techniques uh, to be able to get here today. And you know, and thank you for sharing. It's really what we're talking about is um, that strategy of living a day to day healthy, productive life. So uh, we, I've given this example before, when you get an injury such as a, that requires something such as severe as a knee replacement, they have a, um, a recovery plan for what happens in that. Even if you go get your um, uh, cavity filled at the dentist, they have a recovery plan for you. After they drill it out, there's, they don't tell you to go back out there and start eating hard food right away. You take incremental steps to get there. Sort of that same logic applies to this. So we're going to talk to you a little bit about that strategy of how to plan your recovery. And it's more challenging for people with long COVID because you're multiple, it's multi-symptomatic and you have multiple symptoms. And as you've said, uh, uh, Ash, there are certain symptoms that, um, if they're physical, there's more systems involved. So it's a little bit harder to, to get that sort of recovery back, but cognitive and some of these other things, you can't solve them all. There are some things that you can do a bit different. Well, what do you think, uh, Ash, for that sort of approach? Yeah, I, I think that's a great approach. And I think, you know, as a big picture, it's important to find these strategies, find what works for you. Uh, we'll talk about lots of different strategies today, pick and choose, try different things, see what works for you. And it's really important to find different ways to live life again, as uh, you like to say, mm-hmm. Munich, and, and get back to a productive, you know, somewhat normal, new normal, uh, how to, um, you know, get used to being living in the new you, because we can't, um, we can't put our life on hold forever. Uh, while we wait for the medical system to come up with a treatment for long COVID. Uh, Mm -hmm. So I think these strategies can be really important in improving quality of life. Um, Compartmentalizing is, um, is a great one. It, Mm -hmm. I think it allows you to kind of focus on and enjoy and improve the quality of life in that one aspect um, without worrying, you know, or, or focusing too much heavily on the, on the other aspects. And so you kind of focus and, and gain on those gains. Uh, right now uh, we have, it's almost Super Bowl time and, you know, we want to talk about, we'll, we'll go back to the recovery. I'm going to stitch that in as best we can and our strategies throughout this conversation, but um, we've got a lot of events coming up. So we want to talk about those events that are coming up and these are different. There's different levels of importance for different people, but we have Super Bowl coming up and it's great to get together with friends and just to watch something together. It doesn't have to be Super Bowl. Um, you know, I know some people get together, watch the Oscars. Um, and there's some people who'd like to get together just to go to the movies even. 
And it doesn't have to be a big grand task where you're entertaining. It could be a, a big task. Like if you went to go see one of those, uh, I'll, I'll name the movie Avatar in theater, you've three and a half hours you're going there. That's a lot for some people with, with uh, um, long COVID and it, it can be very stressing. So we're going to talk a bit about that, how you can navigate these things. So big planned events where you're hosting events that may be more taxing when you're going out. So let's talk a bit, a bit about those sorts of strategies. And so we're going to compartmentalize a little bit here as well. well. Let's start off with the stimulus of these events. If you're watching a movie, even though it's just you watching a screen, it's loud sounds. It's there's, there's um, a lot of visual movement and same with the sports thing. It's the same thing. And when you're having a, a, a get together, a larger party, such as a, a Super Bowl party, maybe even if you're hosting Easter or attending a party or an event related to that, you've got a lot of people, a lot of movement, a lot of conversations, and this is all taxing on the brain. It's all taxing on the body. So there's a lot of things that you go. So Ash, what do you do to prepare for those things? And is there a strategy that's been working well for you and a strategy to avoid? Yeah, yeah. So I have, I, I layer strategies. So I, I mm -hmm. take things that are working for me and then I add more strategies in and in. So the first thing that you brought up is a really good point, Munish, is that mm -hmm. these events, they can be fun and exciting and enjoyable um, to a certain extent, uh, but they can be very overstimulating. And that, that overstimulation is what a lot of people with long COVID, especially with the brain fog aspect and the fatigue aspect of it, um, have a lot of challenges with. So I know for myself, um, if I were to attend a big event, I actually bring earplugs with me and I put mm -hmm. earplugs in, uh, so that I'm, you know, able to, it helps filter down the noise a little bit. Um, also a strategy that I used, I, I just used over the holidays when I was seeing family, uh, was I, I would have one conversation with one person in a different area of the party. So it was a little easier to filter out the loud noise. I come from a very large family and, uh, we're all fairly rambunctious. Uh, so there's always a lot of, a lot of noise and stimulation and conversation. Uh, so being able to take one person aside, have a really great conversation with them and then um, take mm -hmm. some time and take a little break in between. Uh, so one of the one of the best strategies is to not push yourself and to take breaks before you feel that overstimulation, um, mm -hmm. and as well as you know minimizing those distractions. So headphones, um, removing yeah. yourself from the bigger crowd, um, anything to help your brain not work too hard with that divided attention. So trying to listen and have a conversation with the person while also trying to tune, tune out uh, the other conversations around. Like you said, for a Super Bowl party, there would be the TV, you know, visual audio sounds. Um, and, uh, and so I've, I find that uh, can be quite helpful just in itself without, without adding in some of the other strategies. So I would uh, certainly suggest, um, suggest that. I went to a, a interesting workshop for uh, years ago for uh, another ailment that affects the the where brain fog is a very similar. It is actually a, a side effect of that type of injury, and they had said the same thing where they you want to have one on one conversations away where possible. And they actually did something quite interesting. They said, look, the sound can really bother some people, and same with the visual stimulus. That so they said, try to have a conversation facing a curtain. So if you can get a person between you and a curtain there, there's less visual stimulus and the noise gets dampened by the curtain. Look at amazing. So just another little added tip there. And then remember, stay within your energy envelope, stay within your tolerance limit for whatever, uh, um, symptom that you have. So if you find that you're starting to lose words, it's a sign that your brain is being overtaxed. It's time to take a break. It's coming up. So be conscious and aware of what's happening. If you're starting to, to find that you're wobbling, restraining your eyes a bit, you're probably losing a little balance and you're overstressing your system. So it's time to take a bit of a break and people don't mind. And it's very easy to say, do you mind if I just go to the restroom? And then you have a quiet space. Hopefully it's quiet. And, uh, and so you can go in there and sometimes at some places they have, um, potpourri in other sense. So there's sometimes that stuff actually helps relax people too. Little yeah, that's tips. right. And brings you brings you back into the moment. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, some other techniques when you when you are stepping away, especially if you feel a little bit uncomfortable stepping away mm -hmm. is um, the five senses. So five things that you can see, four things you can hear, three things you can feel, two things that you can smell and one thing that you can taste if 
if you're able to do that, or even if you're able to do part of that, that mm-hmm. really grounds, that can really ground you and um, make you present in the situation, which will help, you know, bring on that uh, rest and digest mode, which, mm-hmm. which requires less energy. Um, and, and doing things like, like the five senses and, um, you know, deep breathing, even just, just taking a couple, you know, slow, deep breaths that really helps regulate and uh, calm down the nervous system so that then you're able to get back into the crowd, um, or into the, the party or event, um, a little bit more regulated and rested. You know, in one of our live uh, events that we had recently um there was the the occupational therapist talked about some of these techniques as well and saying that look you know even if you are in a space where it's busy and you're not able to focus there's there's a lot going on and you don't have the opportunity to have a curtain behind you they said you can look at a picture you can look at a person's face and just focus on the one part focus on the color focus there's other things you can do to help bring that focus to to get uh, the rest of that noise that white noise i'll call it around you out so if you're in kind of that movie space, Ash, any recommendations on what one can do? Yeah, I would I would say for, for something like a theater, um, again, bringing the earplugs because mm-hmm. they're small, they're portable, they're easy to take with you. Um, and uh, uh, even I actually used to bring sunglasses uh, yeah. everywhere. My, my, my sensitivity to light, my photophobia has improved, thankfully. Mm-hmm. So I'm less dependent on them. But um, taking sunglasses and, um, being able to even just pop them on, you know, I mean, everybody in the theater is not looking at you. They're looking at the, the movie. So, um, that's an easy kind of quick and accessible right there. You, if you find that your eyes are straining or it's a little mm-hmm. bit too much, um, you can pop that on because, um, I know in one of your posts, you mentioned different ways to yeah. minimize that brightness, which is really helpful. But in a theater, you don't have that control. Um, yeah. And, and that, you know, that contrast between the bright screen and the dark atmosphere, uh, might be a bit challenging, but Munish, I, I think that is a great point, um, that you had, uh, posted about the other day about, um, you know, dimming your screens or turning off that blue light. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So we're all on our smartphones and some of our smartphones have settings where they, they adjust to the brightness level of the room. If it'll, if it's, if it's bright out the screen, if it's too, too faint, you won't see it. So it brightens up. If it's too dark, if it's dark in the room, it doesn't need to use as much energy to make it bright. So there's actually these, um, auto adjustment settings that are there and you can actually control that as well. So if you're hypersensitive to the light, you can actually reduce the light level on a device such as your phone such as your tablet or your desktop system. It's very easy to go to your monitor settings and just reduce the brightness. You got to find what works well for you. So that's just the general basics. Now in your workplace, if you're sitting by a window and this is what people, this is the tricky part now is you have your monitor in front of you. And if you have a window off to the side, that's there and you've got two light sources, so your eye is actually trying to adapt to different light sources. And that can be create a strain on the eye. Sometimes you can either close the light, which changes the close a window or block it off so that there's only one light source, but then you are going to want to adjust the monitor or you can reposition yourself more appropriately to that light source and then make the adjustment. But you can then extend how much time you have in front of that sort of electronic device. So in general, those are the, the basic things that are in our post. There's a little bit more detail about how you can do this thing and what's the right sort of setting. And the, the truth of the matter is it's to find the right setting that works for you. It's not the same for everybody because it's, there's other environmental factors. So if you're in an open concept workplace, and we do have, uh, we've talked to a lot of people in healthcare and a lot of people in the education sector um, who've been, who've got long COVID. In their environments, it's a little bit more challenging. They can't do that. So for them, they need focal points. They need to take a five minute break. They can use temperature things. The earplugs make a huge difference. And there is actually some earbuds which have settings that can cancel out ambient noise. So what that does is they, it hears the sound coming in. And if the sound is at a certain volume level directed to you, it treats it as somebody looking at you and talking to you. So it lets that audio go through, but the rest of it, it just mutes a little bit. It doesn't get rid of it completely, but it does help. So look for these That's amazing technology. Yeah. 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 That's amazing technology. That's so helpful. I won't name the brand because I haven't evaluated, but there is actually um, a smart, there's earbuds that connect to your Bluetooth, uh, to your phone. And what it does is has five microphones in it. 
it hears the sound pattern coming in there and it inverts the sound pattern going to your ear. So that's how it cancels it out. So cool. it's set up that way so that it can detect, um, uh, it can come, it, it's, it's not noise isolation, which means we're just blocking the ear to let less sound come in. It's noise canceling. It's true noise cancellation. So that technology works very, very well. But with what they've done with their smartphone adaptation is the smartphone actually picks up noise. And if your phone is in your pocket, it now has a sense of how quiet and how loud the room is. So it knows how to adjust the volume a bit differently. So apparently it's really good at this. So when you come up and somebody's talking to you, if it picks up a volume a bit louder, it, they call it a breakthrough voice. So if somebody's talking to you, it knows because the phone can hear it as much as the earphones or a little bit more. And then they said, that's the person talking to you. So it's really effective. Um, and somehow that the app and their technology that they have for these earbuds, um, they will even listen for emergency sounds. So if there's a police siren, it'll let the siren come through. So it's trained to do that. Wow, that's so neat. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Technology is amazing. True noise cancellation as opposed to true noise isolation. So those are the differences. That's great. Thanks, Vinish. No yeah, problem. yeah. So another another strategy I wanted to make sure we chatted about today um, in regards to coping and how to navigate social events is um, energy and conserving mm. energy, um, saving energy prior to. So, so uh, a lot of people with post COVID or long COVID um, do have you know um, have to use their energy in different ways and they have a, a very a significantly reduced amount of energy. Mm -hmm. Um, so social events can take up much more energy than we had ever expected before. You know, even direct conversations can be really challenging. Um, I find, uh, myself still, even though my brain is probably one of the better things that have come back online, uh, with my long COVID, I, I find I do still, uh, certainly struggle. Mm -hmm. So, uh, one strategy that I found was really helpful is resting before the event. And so post-exertional malaise, um, take can can hit one to three days after uh the event so i actually will prepare three or four days in advance and make sure i i kind of scale down what i'm doing for you know a couple days in advance um do almost nothing else that day so i save all my energy for the day for the event uh and then at the event uh so you know so then that's really increasing that bank and and that energy reserve so you have more energy to spend at the event uh and then when you're there doing things like sitting down um minimizing stimulation because the stimulation actually takes energy for your brain um to process um and even having people come come to you. So rather than you going around, if you were somebody who is maybe a little bit more of an extrovert uh, previously, which is certainly my role, um, you know, I would be somebody who would maybe be working the room a little bit, moving around. Um, but now I take a little bit more of a back seat. I let people come to me uh, to talk and I'm and sitting and sitting takes so much less energy than standing does. And mm -hmm. particularly people who have, you know, some dysautonomia or POTS like symptoms. So they get symptomatic with standing for longer periods of time. Uh, sitting is a great strategy because it uh, doesn't trigger those symptoms in the same way for most people. Uh, and, and then also remembering that after the event, you can still get that crash or that post-exertion malaise one to three days after. So, you know, really a week, you know, on, uh, on three days on either side of the event, uh, to really scale down the activity, uh, so that you're saving it up and, and you're setting yourself up for success. Incredibly powerful stuff that you said, and we've talked to many people in the support circles. We've had a lot of these sorts of conversations and that is gold. And there's, everyone is a bit different and there's an important part to journaling this stuff and to find out how yes. you are and what to prepare for. So as Ash said, you go to an event, you plan something. Usually weddings are on the weekend, so I'll use that as an example or get together. You go to an event, um, you, you're there, and then one to two days later, it's not like, well, I know in one to two days I can plan on Monday or Tuesday that I'm going to feel off. But how long you feel off for and how it affects you is different from person to person. So again, journaling, understanding that stuff. And when you realize that, you know what, it was a few days ago and we get that hero mentality. I feel like I'm better because I just did that and I felt great. And then they find themselves in that crash situation. Again, for those who are yeah. new, crash doesn't mean you're actually physically slamming into anything. It just means that your symptom onset has been so severe that it really feels like you've gone back a step or two. So, and you have to do nothing 
other than rest and recuperate. And that's avoidable. And that's what we're trying to help you uh, do again. So valuable tips here. And, and, uh, and just for yourself, did you notice, the, I, I imagine you have that, you know, at the start of this, at the start of the, the, um, the infection for you, and I imagine for most people, you can go to an event and then two or one or two days later, maybe three days later, you feel that crash and you're out for like a week. Then several months later, you do something a bit different when you're engaging thing, maybe resting in advance of that. And you still get a, uh, you still have some downtime that's required one or two days later, but instead of it taking a week off, it's taking five days. And then later on you get a bit better and it's now two days of rest. But you see, if you monitor and measure that, you can see the progress. Exactly, exactly. And, and I think that's such an important point, Munish, about monitoring the progress mm-hmm. and, and writing it down, documenting it in whatever way, you know, feels right to you, whether that's a journal or a notebook, or whether, you know, you're an Excel sheet type of person, and you like to input information so you can trend it. Um, documenting is so important, because I think what a lot of us forget with brain fog is that our perception of time Uh, can be different. Mm -hmm. And we cannot, and our recall and our memory uh, specifically can be impacted. So especially when we're more symptomatic, um, our ability to recall those memories and remember exactly how challenging it was, um, is not as accurate as, you know, it might be now a year later after you made a year's worth of progress. Um, so documenting and being able to look back and reflect and really look at those small wins, um, which are, which are big wins, right? If you're able to socialize more and enjoy your life and and make those connections. I mean, to me, that's a really big win to be able to connect with others again, um, and going from total isolation, you know, so, so documenting, I think is, um, we can't underrate it. You know what? You said something that just reminded me of what happened. My, my wife has a brain injury and she had uh, um, cognitive brain impairment and a variety of other things that come up similar to what's going on with people with long COVID. And she used to go to these um, uh, assessments. And when she would go to the assessment, she would forget to talk about things that have happened. She would say it beforehand. So it's there. But when she showed up, she forgot all these things. And she was taught, they, they said, what's the last um, event that she went to. And she remembered a birthday party. She hadn't gone to one of our children's birthday party for over five years because it was just too stimulating for her and she mm-hmm. couldn't handle that. Mm-hmm. But she remembered only the one, the last one that she went to, but she didn't highlight the fact for five birthday parties for her kids, she never went. So yeah, it's very important for, even for your own, the information you need to share to your, your care team to have that sort of information on hand. And for a doctor or a person in your care team to look at this and say, well, I see how much calories you're consuming. If they're looking at it from a nutritional angle, I can see the kind of, it gives them so much more information to better understand you. So it's, it's to improve the quality of care that you get. So, yeah, exactly. And that, that's a great point. And, and even just that stress of an appointment, um, can cause that brain fog mm-hmm. to flare up and, uh, and that cognitive impairment to be worse. You know, that stress of the conversation, not knowing, you know, what the conversation is going to be like and, you know, or even the excitement because you're excited to see this new care provider. Um, that in itself can cause that memory lapse. Mm-hmm. So that's a great point. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, Manish. And, and if you think of the, the signals that you're sending your brain and your body, if you're focused on the negative, and I mean, I, I will be the first one to admit it. Mm-hmm. When I got long COVID uh, or post COVID this uh, most recent time, uh, especially when it was so severe, like I was in total despair. I did not know what to do with my life anymore. There, I mean, there was really nothing I could do with my life. I was so debilitated. It, it was honestly, it was it was probably the hardest time of my entire life, and I was trying to figure out you know, things to do and, and headache, you know, how do I pull myself up out of this, mm-hmm. um, you know, from, from every perspective, but I found acceptance of where I'm at right now, mm-hmm. um, was almost an antidote to the despair because it's just accepting that this is the situation that I'm in right now. You know, I, I, you know, I know it's not going to change overnight. Um, but, but just accepting where you are, I think, um, is really important. And if you think of the signals that that sends back to your body, if you're entirely distressed all of the time about it, I mean, you're sending signals to your body that, you know, things are unsafe. I'm in danger. Um, I'm, you know, 
there's a big problem constantly that chronic stress Mm -hmm. is not going to help your body heal and, um, and kind of create that feedback loop. So being able to find those moments of happiness and joy, things that you're looking forward to, um, are really important. And this is not toxic positivity. You know, we, we also do have to create a lot of space and we do this in our support circles, create a lot of space for those, you know, big emotions that can come up. Um, with all of these challenges, you know, we, um, I was just, just going to add that, uh, we're talking about the strategy in this plan to getting better living life and, and navigating these social norms that we want to get back to. That's what we're striving for. We can get there that we can get to them safely in a way that's not going to harm our healing plan and recovery path. Um, but it's complementary to it. Um, in my personal situations that, that I have at home and stuff, uh, my spouse lost the ability to drive distances. So for her to learn a strategy to navigate within that limitation, gave her back some independence that she lost. She thought she'd lost forever, but it wasn't true. And the only way she got that was by connecting with other people. And that's one of the things that somebody else said, I was just like you a year ago. I never drove. I couldn't go far because of these problems, but here's how I overcame them. And they gave all the tips. And that was the same stuff we hear here. You plan your route. You take some, uh, you take the breaks that you need You work within your energy envelope and that, and then you celebrate those moments. And so when she had to drive 10 minutes, which was all she could drive at one point, she'd stop, she'd take a coffee and she would always drink her coffee outside the vehicle. So she could feel the sunlight on her. She could feel the breeze on her and just be in the moment, which is mindfulness, which is something, a technique that not a lot of people master, but she now appreciates life very differently and she looks at nature and everything very differently and she never used to want to take big long um walks in in the woods and that sort of stuff and now she's very comfortable doing that stuff and just appreciates those moments more and we do it as a family now which we never did before so it's quite it's quite a fascinating journey and how we've all gotten involved with this yeah that that that's such a beautiful that's a really beautiful story right because it's you know even though you're not getting back to ideally everyone is going to get back to their old selves but you know their their old selves is maybe not the the picture perfect life either mm-hmm. right and and being able to get to a spot where you're happy and you really enjoy enjoy life where you're at is is that's beautiful yeah and and uh i'm just going to ask you ash if you have any tips that you would give to somebody to navigate that we haven't already said? I think the only other thing would be around um, Mm -hmm. food and substances. So, um, you know, alcohol, uh, you know, is a common uh, social (laughs) lubricant, so to say, uh, for, for a lot of people. And I mean, especially, especially, you know, I think people can develop a lot of anxiety if they haven't been out socializing for a while, especially if they're a little bit worried, um, you know, about contracting Mm -hmm. COVID again. Uh, so, but keeping in mind that alcohol is, you know, a little bit harder on the brain. It does worsen brain fog or cognitive impairment. Uh, so you can choose to drink if you'd like, uh, but keeping in mind um, that there are consequences to that. And same with other si- substances, you know, cannabis is another popular one. Um, you know, understanding that that's okay if that's what you want to do, but understanding that, you know, that that also may can contribute to some more symptoms and food is another big thing that a lot of long haulers um, seem to be really Mm -hmm. sensitive to and symptomatic with. And uh, you know, kind of remembering that if it's worth it for you to eat differently because that's um, what's happening at the party or event um, then that's okay. And that's great. And, and, you know, you just work within those understanding that you may become more symptomatic, but a strategy would be to, eat and drink normally, stay well hydrated and, you know, maybe not indulge in the different foods if that's easier or, or minimally indulge if that's uh, easier to help minimize your symptoms, if you care more about the, you know, conversations and socializing. So just remembering that all of those things do play a balance and prioritizing, you know, choosing one, there's no right answer, just choosing one. So uh, you actually said something that, that reminded me of a couple of other little tips here. Number one, um, I've been told this before, alcohol is not a stimulant. 
So people mistaken that it's, it's not a, it's a depressant and, and also it draws water out of your system and we have to remain hydrated for health. So you've got to make sure you take this in moderation. Again, there's that hero complex that comes in saying, I'm feeling great. The endorphins are up because I'm talking to people. I'm happy to be at this event. And then suddenly it, it hits you and it hits you out of nowhere because you're not monitoring and having a plan and a strategy that's being engaged. So be clear on that. The other thing too, is I do, um, I have uh, family members here with, with severe allergies. So when we go to events, we don't want people to take away from, from their plans. So we tend to bring actually our own uh, snacks and some of our own meals and that. And, and, and interestingly enough, it's now turned to the point where a lot of people tell us to bring one of these gluten-free dishes or um one of these low histamine <laughs> items great. into the thing there because they're like that's i didn't realize how good it is and and some people don't even realize they have problems themselves and they try this stuff and they feel cleaner they feel better so it's actually turned into a little bit it's where it's it's evolving the relationship with with some of our friends and our family too and my parents for example have cut down on gluten because of the allergies that's in our house and they're noticing a big difference in their health so just food for thought, literally. Yeah, that's great. And, and I think I think that. Do you have any other strategies? I think the, those are. I think we touched on all the ones that I was um, hoping. No, to bring I think to we. The table I think we touched them all. But just to recap again, people are brain fog and that. We want you to live life again. There's ways to do it. You have to have a plan and a strategy. If you don't know how, the community is definitely going to make a big difference for you. The tools are here. You can search for all sorts of things, but. There's a group here that have done this, have worked with it, and they're seeing the results and the benefits. And there's a community to support you and cheer you on. And when you fall off to the side or fall back, they're here to help get you up and get you back on path. So that's the benefits of this all. But the, if you're going into these events, earplugs help reduce the sound, reduce the stimulus. Um, taking the breaths, taking the breaks, and operating within your energy envelope, operating with your cognitive envelope, and understanding that there are different kinds of envelopes, even for food tolerance. You have to be aware of it, and there's ways to figure that out. There are simple things you can do with technology that can help extend your envelope. So let's embrace those things. Stay healthy, stay happy, and stay focused, and things will get better so you can live life again. Ah, no, that's wonderful. Yeah, thanks, Munish. This is this has been great. Um, I hope people find mm -hmm. it helpful. Uh, let us know in the comments if there's anything else you'd like us to discuss. Thanks for joining us for this episode of The Long Haulers, the official podcast of the post-COVID support community. We hope you enjoyed this episode and that it'll help you take a step toward leading a healthier, happier, and more productive life. Take charge of your recovery at postcovidcommunity.com, where you can learn more about membership benefits and join our newsletter to get the latest information and tips from our network of specialized healthcare professionals. And don't forget to follow us on YouTube and your favorite social platforms at Long Hauler Life. Please share this episode with other long haulers in need of assistance. Take care.